Python. So last time we have started with overall Python determining with the uh, you know overall for the solutioning, like how do we align the data with the solution, right? Anyone to you know share their words in terms of how do you you know what's the need for cleaning the data and how do you go about it? from your you know uh, thought process from your understanding this is important because uh, in the interview this question will come and you know there are uh, lots and lots of chances this might be you know third question or something like that so so anybody want to go ahead why do you clean data what's the need of cleaning the data so that we can have a, a good model based on good uh, data like if some of the data is is, is skewed or there are more outliers, then you cannot make a proper decision about the data. Right, perfect. Outliers is a good technical term, but even cleaning the data now, we need to put some technicality into that, right? As data scientists normally deal with huge amount of data, normally we work with big data. If not, um, normally, you know, the maximum, uh, about 80, 85% of solutions, they are normally tuned up with the big data. So you are working with, uh, you know, uh, at least gig or, you know, Peter or zettabyte of data here. And what we're trying to do, we are trying to solve a business problem or basically complete a uh, business requirement, right? How do you do it? You normally try to understand the problem and collect a data related to that problem. Be it a requirement, be it a solution, be it a research, you have to make sure the data, which might be in a beta or zeta, you know, white size, uh, given to you, you need to make it sure you have only the data required for uh, your uh, solution, right? And that's why you normally need to clean the data. Now, as we've seen, there are, you know, uh, steps of cleaning the data. Uh, you know, that. So what we, we normally start with, I don't know um, where that slide on, but no problem. So we normally start with uh, making sure uh, we uh, you know set the procedure for retrieving the data one way or the other. Yeah, this one. I think uh, we might have quite a few empty cells. We might have data in a wrong format. We might have wrong data altogether, and wrong data comes in multiple types. Like you have you know uh, instead of um, date, you might have a day of the week. Uh, instead of a date, you might have a date in wrong format. Instead of uh, you know whatever the category or the column number, the data can be you know a different sometimes. So we need to get these uh, things rectified. Then of course duplicates is another level of problem. Like you know you have too many duplicates. Even in primary key, there are chances. Uh, like you know we have quite a few number of uh, duplicates. So we need to make sure we remove, eradicate all these problems to make sure whatever data we have is in line with the our thought process, is in line with our requirement, right? So at least, you know, 30, 40% of these things should come while you're speaking. And these answer needs to be pretty technical because that's what basically sets your foot in a, you know, concrete floor. And that's what generates the trust of an interviewer, right? So for that matter, we need to understand how to frame this answer and some of these answers we need to pre-prepare. First uh, and foremost question, tell me about yourself. So tell me about yourself normally talks about where do you reside, state and zip, uh, what type of you know work you're doing or how your career progression is, then your educational background so that the interviewer understands the alignment with your uh, you know uh, JD and this makes the first uh, foremost impression uh, or the confidence uh, for the interviewer to take you as an employee. And this starts employee or a consultant, depending upon the interview, depending on the host and all this. So this is the first thing we start. Second one, tell me about your current project. And these two questions were might ask in different word, but they are there one way or the other. So in the next uh, uh, question, tell me about yourself, tell me about your current work, uh, tell me what you're doing currently. Tell me what you do in your, you know, current job and so on. So there could be many different words used for the similar question. So we'll work on this second question. So second question, I will take it, uh, uh, tell him or her, the interviewer, about what I'm doing right now. And this should be in alignment with the JD. So if JD is looking for a data scientist in the uh, uh, banking area, then you should 
uh, stress yourself in those banking things we, which you did. What type of you know model have you built? How do you you know get your uh, uh, how how do you used to get the data? How do you used to process the data? How do you used to clean the data? So data cleaning is a kind of integral part of the data science. Unless and until you know the importance and the girth and the width and the weightage of these things, uh, it's difficult to gain the trust of the uh, um, data scientist type of interviewer or data solutioning type of interviewer for, for that matter. We are scientists, right? So as a scientist, we should know our target. We should know our, uh, even what we have in hand. So for that matters, this is what we have in hand. The data given to you might be in a multifolds, like, you know, it might be gigabyte, petabyte and all those things. But actual solutioning, you have to get it processed in so much data. Normally, you don't consume the 100% data. You normally work on around 30 to 40% of it. And that's a normal, you know, average you can fight in our IEEE sites. Because we work with data, whatever is relevant to the solution that we need to construct. That's why data cleaning is one of the most important part. And with the answer of this question, you can really gain the trust of the interviewer. So this question is really, really important. Okay, I couldn't stress enough. So please uh, do work on these things in the next session also, you know, we might discuss on this and you can share your, uh, you know, idea. Even you can mention some of the, you know, methods name and some of the, you know, uh, variables name, the process you might have used or you would like to use or you know about. So this will generate some confidence in terms of you have did this thing, so you know it in and out and so on and so forth, right? So yes, uh, cleaning the data can be something like dropping the columns here. It's because I don't I means uh, you know most of the scenario when you talk about some uh, database in terms of employees or customers, they they have all sort of uh, you know even unrequired details like the street names, the you know house name and all those things. But whenever you normally try to understand a consumer behavior, depending upon a region, a zip code and a state is more than enough. So you normally target zip code you might target a state sometimes you might target a city sometimes so these are the things which we don't need their you know um, most most of the time we don't need their house numbers their street name and so on and so forth so these type of things we might need to uh, you know understand we might need to align ourselves in terms of building the solution or getting the data clean in a progressive manner right changing the index of a data frame now what is index index is the sequence now uh, index is basically um, a sequence aligned with certain weightage of a uh, category or weightage of a column value. And you do it with, yeah, well, there are functions uh, for indexing. You might normally do it with, you know, getting the data first converted into CDS and then run those index method what we have available or get it converted into data frame and then you have data frames indexing methods. You can do it with data frame as well. And you normally do it with data frame because that's easier, faster, and so on and so forth. And then after indexing, you can understand the data progression in terms of the solution you need to build. So uh, as far as you know, trying to understand the consumer behavior, I might go with the consumers with a bigger spend. So the consumer who spends much, you know, better amounts uh, than others will be my top priority customer. So if something like that customer uh, walks into my uh, you know, establishment, I normally try to welcome him, respect him, hi, hello, good morning, good evening, and all those kind of stuff. And kind of, uh, you can say a buttering up in a, you know, a typical form, non-formal English. So what you try to do, you try to capture the best customers you have. You try to uh, encourage them to purchase more, or you try to get the biggest uh, wallet they have for your store. And that's why you can, you know, maximize your throughput. And these are the normal, you know, standard uh, uh, techniques we use for marketing. So whenever you're trying to align with some data, you need to make sure your data is aligned with your solution, aligned with your thought process, aligned with your uh, whatever, uh, you know, progression you want in terms of uh, data increments. So that's a kind of another thing. Then tidying up. This is basically tidying up in the sense you're trying to create subgroup, supergroup. So I might uh, segment my data into top 10 customer into, you know, um, really uh, uh, repetitive customer into customer with, uh, you know, uh, might be economic, uh, need some economic support. There are customers that normally they come once in a blue moon, but they really spend good amount and so on and so forth. So I might segment my customer if I'm trying to understand the customer behavior. 
I'm sharing this solution because just to make you understand how this reflects actually in a practical life, right? So dropping the fill column, I might not need that data. I'll just drop or remove that data from the complete database so that I know what's required for me. And I need to don't really go to those data, which is not really, uh, you know, crucial, important or decision making for my uh, solution at hand, right? And then changing index, as we know, we have to categorize the data in terms of progressive manner so that my solution generation is more in line with my um, data needs, right? Uh, and then tidying up, we try to build some, you know, segment the data into groups, subgroups, and so on, so forth. These tidying up fields, that's why I normally, uh, you know, get that word tidying up that fields. So tidying up and basically, we basically creating segmentation or subgroup, supergroup, and so on, so forth. Okay, tidying up means realigning data. If not uh, in uh, you know progressively, you might super subgroup or supergroup and so on so forth. Then combining the string methods with NumPy to clean columns. Again, here after indexing, after tidying up thing, I might come up with quite a few data which is repetitive in nature, which I really don't need. So I can basically what uh, in segmentation what I can do: top end customer, best spending customer base repetitive customer. And then I'll basically number this behavioral in some British format. So here, what we are trying to do, we are trying to un, uh, 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 align the data with my needs in terms of weightages, in terms of understanding the depth of the data, or we are trying to go towards the business decision-making process here. So here, I'm trying to go with the data, which is uh, repetitive in nature, which is not really required for my solutioning purpose. Okay, then I no normally go on a second level of cleaning where I try to build some graphs, I try to build some pie chart, I try to build some pivot tables, uh, I try to get some business inference of the data on a query level. The solution which um, I need might be a kind of uh, English like, uh, you know, business decisions which business need from the given data. But here I'm reaching that, uh, you know, target slowly, steadily. And there could be multiple representation of, uh, let's say geography spread, let's say spend um, uh, consumer behavior, spending natures or segmentation and so on and so forth. So I might create a pie chart with the, you know, uh, the revenue generated from top 10 customer, most spent customer, uh, the local customer, the remote customer, and so on. So, so this way, I'm trying to support the business to make better business, to make better profitability. And there are various functions which support me, even in um, Pandas and NumPy as well. Now, today we are going to ponder more on NumPy, as we have done quite a few examples in Panda, and we'll understand how this combination works. Most of the data scientist solutions, even today, they are basically in combination of pandas and numpy. Well, we might use another, uh, you know, uh, data library, uh, another libraries, but or they are specific to certain domains, specific to certain problems. Okay, so let's try to understand um, you know, this thing in depth. Okay, oh, sorry, uh, the last uh, point remaining: uh, renaming the columns and skipping the rows. Now, most of the time, whatever data we get, they might have the category name, the column name, or the you know, type of data name in a different, uh, whoever created the data, whoever modified the data or how they were collecting the data, that's their, uh, you know, easiness. But for me as a data scientist, I might need, might need to change those column name to a more relevant title. I need to change those category name to more relevant uh, title to my data scientist solution, right? So for that, I might rename and skip some rows. Skip some row in the sense, I still have some row where I don't use them repeatedly, but there might be something base row for my calculation. So when I categorize, when I segment, and I need to verify those segmentation, I might keep those columns or categories even in my database to make sure whatever I created is in line with those categories or in line with those volumes and the depth of the data. So that's why I normally rename some columns. I normally hide some column. I normally skip some rows because what I try to do, I try to categorize them. I try to build weightage based on the records. So if I have so many customers 
who are spending more than, let's say, uh, $1,000 a month. So what I'll do, I'll create another table. And this is what we call normally normalization in database language. So I normalize my table to make sure whatever I have at hand is useful for my current, uh, you know, throughput or current um, analysis of the data. Now, this is the, uh, you know, uh, step which most of the data scientists keep and they keep using bigger amount of data and losing their efficiency into the solution. Let me tell you a simple example. Normally, um, when you talk about a database developer, they like to have joins, you know, table joins, right? So if you're trying to, you know, uh, solve a business problem, like uh, give me the um, most costly employee. Let's say a PMO analyzing, uh, you know, to do some cost reduction, they want to get a data of most, uh, you know, um, salaried employee within the organization. So what they will do, they'll ask these database guys, um, hey, the database administrator, hey, database uh, manager, could you please give me a, you know, number of uh, top, uh, 50 uh, employees as far as there is salary spending goes. So what uh, the guy will do, that guy will create some couple of joints and believe me, not two, three joints, he'll create at least five joints, get the data, index it and give it to the, you know, uh, superior in terms of table or a graph or a pie chart or, you know, uh, pilot table. This is normally happens. Now, whenever you do these joints, you are wasting the, uh, what you can say, the really important uh, calculation cycles on these joins. And uh, if you, uh, you don't know how joins are made, joins are basically one table uh, with two tables, uh, the attached two tables in our, you know, uh, random access memory. And these joins basically give the impression of one table instead of two tables to the uh, calculation engine of a database or a logical um, layer, whatever you have in your application, right? So for that matters, the oral calculations or the oral indexing or uh, the data throughput or, you know, data inference uh, drawing process takes much longer time in terms of joins. Now, how to avoid that? As a data scientist, we should know how these database administrator, database developers, database manager, they work in a real life. I need to solve those challenges. I need to make sure I take some extra step to, um, uh, what you can say, to nullify those, uh, you know, increased complexity. Even they have normalized database at their hand, they keep this joint thing. So joint and uh, normalization goes um, <clears throat> like east and west. So if you have more joints, you are actually reducing the normalizations of whoever is done for the database. Because you believe this, those, those two tables should be, uh, you know, you can join by various clauses also, but still, Whenever you um, work on something like join, it reduces the efficiency of a data throughput. So here, our you know whatever experience you have with the data handling comes at play, and we will make sure the efficiency of data matters at the most uh, at most because we are working on a huge amount of data, and that's a normal scenario. That's average scenario for every data scientist. And for that matters, we need to understand the normalization of a database. So there are many ways uh, we need to analyze the database first in an actual structured sense, and then go on uh, renaming our columns, skipping the rows are cleaning the data altogether. Does that make sense? Anybody have any question on these? Would you understand what I'm trying to say here? Yeah, yeah. I'm good. I'm good. This is a kind of, you know, a need for each and every data scientist who try to build a solution for a given business problem. And this is more to do with alignments of a business problem rather than my thought process. So if business problem is pertaining to the, you know, indexing or progressive weightages of this data, I need to align it so. So we need to understand the business problem or business requirement and we align our data according to this, uh, according to the requirement um, we'll align our techniques according to the requirement. Okay, so let, let's go to, you know, um, step further and we'll try to understand how do we basically um, use these methodologies in, uh, you know, uh, Pandas 
and then we'll have a look at it uh, num, uh, even numpy and we'll try to uh, use numpy and panda together jointly to make sure we have the most efficient data scientist solution or data cleaning techniques we could use in our day-to-day -day life in our day-to-day -day programming technique Yeah, uh, please give me a minute. Right. Okay, yes. So, well, when you um, talk about something like, you know, pandas, uh, there are quite a few good amount of, you know, uh, techniques or uh, methods we need to use. And I try to create a separate slide rather than one program because each and every of these methods, we are going to use it extensively. Okay, so let's try to you know start with one. One way to deal with empty cell is to remove the rows that contain empty cell. Because whenever you use empty cells in your database, this means that the records, right, they are not complete in their nature. So where wherever there is a null value, I might remove the record itself. Because as a data scientist. I'm normally looking for a concise data. I'm, on, I'm normally looking for a conclusive data. And if there are empty cells, and again, this is subjective to what type of solution you are building, what type of require, requirements uh, you have in hand, what type, type of business inference you want to pull it out of data, or what, what type of decision you're going to make on the given data sets, right? So here, what we're trying to do, we are trying to understand the conciseness, the completeness of data, and I, how to get the data pre-cooked or clean the data in terms of getting that conclusiveness. It's usually okay since the data set can be very big and removing a few rows will not have a big impact on a result. Now, when we discussed about that outlier and inliers, there, there we've seen like uh, if you skip the outliers and inliers, the normalized data which we have, uh, you, you might call it normalized curve, bell curve data where most of the data sets, uh, most of the records fall into the uh, average values, right? So removing a couple of values doesn't really impact the overall, you know, weightages of the data, even you try to index it and all, right? So for that matters, we might knock out a couple of Now, this is not a thumb rule. This is more of a decision as a data scientist you need to take. Okay, so how that empty cell is differing your inferences uh, drives this method, drives this understanding of cleaning the data. And here, what we're trying to do, we're trying to use a method called drop in a. Now, as we've seen, whenever we try to display the data from a CVS or, uh, you know, uh, you might, uh, you know, refer it from a SQL table or a big data table. the uh, null values or uh, any values normally can be dropped with drop in a. So here we are basically uh, read the SV files and reverse with just a simple, uh, you know, method called drop in a uh, from the pandas visitor. Okay, try um, uh, doing these things by yourself and, uh, you know, we can share the result in our next session. Here, what we are trying to do, we are trying to clean the record. We are trying to remove the record um, with the null values. This might be something like we are trying to regulate uh, the primary key, the foreign key, and those kind of uh, categories as well. But even if not, then up to a certain extent, I don't want incomplete data uh, in my you know clean data set. So I might use this method called drop in a. It's a part of um, data frame and uh, we use, uh, you know, pandas uh, to basically have this uh, data frame cleaned up. Okay. Does that make sense? Any question on this? Simple enough? Yeah. It's yes. Understood. Yeah. Okay, okay. So try to, you know, um, uh, use drop in it, try to find out how actually it does get, uh, you know, executed on a ground level. Now we just seen one. Now let's try to look at the other way to clean the data. These are the what we we are referring to the missing value. To make detecting missing value is easier, and across the different array or uh, data types, pandas provide is null, not null function, which can uh, which are also methods on a series of data frame objects. 
so even data frames uh, you know gives you uh, quite a good number of um, methods like is null not not and um, uh, this is how we use them basically in our uh, normal day-to-day uh, -day programming thing. These are really simpler. That's why data cleaning makes simpler for you. Only you need to think to, you need to do your ample of research, why you are doing it, and just start implementing this uh, method. Start using this method as per your requirement, as per your requirement, according to your, uh, you know, business need, according to your solution you want to develop, okay? So there's again, there's a, you know, uh, this method drop in a, then there's a is null and not null, right? Same thing, Let, let's take a step further. Uh, I'll, I'll share this PPT so you know what type of, you know, thing I have used. I have already given this program. The program link is is null check dot py. Okay, let me try to, you know, run this for you so that you'll understand. And uh, uh, you have this program I have uh, shared with you on a zip file. If not, let me know, I'll share the zip file again. And here, what we're trying to do, we are trying to clean the data with all the missing values, or I'm trying to remove the uh, records with uh, missing values, right? Oh, uh, okay. Let me open that program. Okay, I'll, I'll share the... Yeah, yeah, yes. Yes, is null check was the Python file. Could you see these things? It's the same copy of, uh, you know, whatever I have been uh, showing you. Uh, let me open the presentation again. So this is what the, you know, file I'm uh, you know, trying to use the, uh, uh, Code I'm use you can cut copy paste from here also. So I'll, I'll share this uh, PDF with you, and I'm trying to run this thing. So here, uh, let's go to Spider. In the Spider, I have a data frame with some you know uh, uh, a random value generated, and then I'm you know trying to re-index uh, uh, those uh, data frame in a way. Okay, let's try to play it again. Now they have indexed and they basically align. Uh, uh, indexed and they have, uh, you know, categorized the data uh, in a, uh, what you can say, uh, progressive uh, alphabets, okay? This is just a simple program to understand how we are going to achieve the, the indexing as well as uh, uh, to, uh, no, this is just for indexing, I believe, right? Yeah, this is just for the indexing thing. It's not null value check. So let me open the null value checks to have a file. Yeah, this is with a null. Uh, and you know, we are trying to use a scalar value here. Okay, this is, you know, uh, uh, okay, let me talk about this thing. Okay, let me talk about this uh, thing first. Uh, there are some, you know, good uh, methods available in terms of random function. We've learned the random function, right? And as we seen earlier, uh, when we use random function, we have a good amount of uh, restrictions can be applied to the random function as well. It's a method of uh, null pi. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me complete this step by step. Uh, I think there's a you know bit of uh, mix up on a sequence. But let, let's try to understand. Here, uh, I'm doing a random function with restriction, okay? We'll see about this random function with restriction in, uh, you know, a uh, few slides. Uh, that's a kind of, you know, uh, uh, method available in uh, NumPy. So that's why it's, uh, you know, um, given in a couple of slides later, okay? So um, for the, you know, um, missing values, I can use is null, not null, and uh, the other one is uh, drop in, right? Now, uh, the, some point of trying, uh, the data cleaning also needs to be done because we are trying to uh, use the data set with null value, but getting replaced by more relevant uh, term, more relevant uh, uh, value uh, inserted to it. So we might replace the uh, null value with a scalar value, okay? So there are also, you know, uh, methods in, uh, in uh, um, pandas where it can help us to replace these things. 
So rather than having N A N, I might replace it with zero. I might uh, replace it with the actual string called N U double L, and so on so forth, or missing value or something like that. So which is more relevant whenever I'm trying to uh, analyze the data uh, with my you know observation skill or something like that sort. So there I'm trying to get the data in line with my um, requirement with my solutions. And uh, for that, I might re uh, require to replace these uh, missing values with some uh, specified string, specified term, which can be a kind of, uh, you know, um, reserved as well. Most of the time it's a reserved, a reserve word. Sometimes you can create your own terminology. And this is what we are using uh, as far as, you know, uh, from a UI perspective as well. So if I need to present an uh, error to the user, rather than saying none, I might uh, you know, uh, display it as a zero, or I might display it as a missing value and something like that. So, so if we use the word, uh, word uh, you know, the uh, method called, uh, uh, random, random index, 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 and where am I replacing these things with a scalar value? Yes, fill in. Fill in is a method where I'm trying to um, replace the NAs or NAN with some uh, specified uh, string, specified, uh, rather, most of the times we use string, even if you want to insert zero, we use string, but sometimes you, you might use zero as a value, as an integer value or a complete number value for that matters. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Anybody have any question at this moment? I know it's a bit uh, confusing. Let's try to understand a random function and then we'll basically, uh, you know, uh, um, can do it effectively or can th uh, think it through effectively. And there's something called fill in a forward and ba backward. Now, when we try to, uh, uh, address a part of record. Like if you want to exclude the outlier or inliner, you normally go with something like a specified row in target. So after you index, you can uh, basically use this method, fill forward and fill back, uh, back fill, uh, uh, fill, uh, B fill, and these type of methods where you normally, <coughs> you normally, uh, use a specified rows to fill with uh, certain, uh, you know, um, um, certain predefined string, certain predefined integer. Here in this program, we have <laughs> used the, you know, random method to generate a data frame, and then we index the data frame, and then we use this fill in a method. Okay, if I go through, let's say, if I want to find a really good depth here, so what I'll do, I'll go to, uh, I'll go to my Google, where's my Google? Um, yeah, I'll go to my Google, and here, I'll go to w 3 and I can directly, uh, you know, uh, oh man, fill in a, I'll just search fill in a here, See, fill in a is a data frame method and it came as a first. So here I can understand how fill in a method is, uh, you know, helping me out. So they are using something called data CV. The best part of, uh, you know, W3 school, they have, uh, you know, a program ready made for you. And they are all these, you know, uh, different method who are near and dear to this method also available to you, right? So here, um, Pindas data fill in a method, here, replace null values with a number, a specified number. And this is also kind of integer, right? So uh, they use a CSV file, which is also available for you can download. And believe me, it's a data uh, uh, .cp So if you open here, here, see, this is the CSV file. So you can just, uh, it's a tab separated, uh, you know, uh, this thing. And you can just cut, copy, paste, or you can uh, copy this thing and save it in your notepad as a CSV file also. So these uh, things do help a lot. Try to visit uh, WT school and they have almost given a extensive, uh, you know, examples also. Okay, 
So, uh, oh, this is a really small example. But yes, there's a fill uh, NA method. It replaces null value with the specified value. Redefines the data frame object unless the in-place parameter is set to true. Now, there are, like you're replicating the data frame. So that's also another thing. So if you're trying to uh, address fill NA with, um, you know, uh, replicating the object in a memory that might slow down your processing. So you might want to use something like in-place parameter so that it won't create a, another uh, data frame by itself. If you're, uh, you know, using a huge data, so your memory uh, have a, you know, kind of limited resource overall, right? So for that matters, they're guiding you. And there are other parameters which you can use uh, to have these, uh, you know, uh, fill in a method used uh, efficiently. So there's a value, there's a, you know, uh, backfill, B field, pad, F field, and so on and so forth. And believe me, this is the latest one. I might uh, have some older uh, method reference in my PPT because it was around three months old, but this is updated almost on a weekly basis. So you might have a better, uh, you know, uh, um, understanding of the methods available within this gamut of uh, uh, methods you are going to use, okay? And then if you want to, you know, uh, understand the data frame by itself, it gives you all the great, uh, you know, uh, examples for um, uh, data frames. You can try it yourself and, you know, you can go next, previous and all those things. It's really a good number of examples available here. You can go to the next and then there's a read CVS file and so on and so forth. Okay, so play around with uh, even this W3 screw, which is really a great uh, um, point to start understanding these different methods and uh, different methods available within themselves. So rather than going for, uh, you know, any uh, limited number of uh, uh, methods which uh, have discussed, which we might have, you know, understood, we can go to W3 screw and, uh, you know, Try to understand the latest methods as well. Okay, let's uh, take a step further. Drop in a we have just seen. Uh, let's try to understand NumPy. Okay, sorry. Any any question for me so far? No. No. Yeah, okay. Uh, these are simple methods, but this helps a lot uh, for a given data scientist. So for that matters, uh, we need to understand. Or if some interview might ask you, how do you clean your data in terms of uh, syntactically or programmatically? So you can, you know, tell them these three method, uh, three, four method, uh, you know, drop in a uh, fill null or, you know, uh, these methods uh, so that uh, he know, he, uh, he will confident that, you know, what do you mean by cleaning and how do you clean these things? Okay. Now let's start to understand NumPy. Okay. Uh, NumPy is one of the most, uh, you know, libraries used uh, 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 within Python Gambit, Python platform as such, and uh, it's normally worked with arrays rather than data frames. Um, if you look at pandas, is normally worked with data frames. NumPy is normally worked with arrays. Uh, does that make it less efficient? Uh, I'll say no, because uh, NumPy is more to do with numbers. And uh, if you know about the numbers, uh, numbers and arrays, they are much simpler uh, to understand, to observe, to execute. Data frames is a complex data type. You can have numbers, strings, and every, you know, uh, data type available within uh, Python platform. But NumPy is mostly numerical Python. So we normally doing with the most of the numerical question here, and we use arrays most of the time. Okay. If theoretically, if I ask you, does it make inefficient? Uh, the, uh, does it make the um, you know program inefficient in some way? It can. So we need to keep an extra observing eye open to make sure whatever we are programming is in line with the uh, solution need. Uh, and we might use some um, uh, few inefficient method if that makes your life easy. That makes your program more maintainable. So then there are different weightages when you create solution, right? There's one is efficiency, there's one is quality, readability, uh, maintainability, and all those things. So that time, I need to create a balance as a solution architect, as a data scientist, and to create a balance between these uh, uh, available, you know, uh, terminology in terms of types of program. So there, I might choose one over the other. 
sometimes if i'm working in terms of uh, i'm developing a solution i might use numpy extensively but when i'm releasing the solution i might uh, need to try to replace numpy with pandas as much as possible because pandas is the efficient in terms of throughput in terms of calculation in terms of execution but whenever i am trying to have a code reliability at a better uh, you know angle or at a better uh, weightage i might go with the numpy so numpy is a python library used for working with arrays it also has a function for working domain of linear algebra fourier transfer the matrices and so on and so forth so i normally use all these uh, you know different theorems different um, um, numerical progressions uh, fourier laplace and all those things with the use of numpy numpy was created by uh, 25 uh, by travis alpert uh, he is also available on twitter as well as uh, you know facebook or youtube you can have a look at his uh, you know uh, twitter specifically because uh, he normally try to share quite a few of new ideas in terms of how the machine learning is benefiting from some of these um, transformations or some of these linear algebra equations uh whenever he is trying to implement a solution so he is vocal about it and he is a good um, what you can say contributor to the open system uh, development space so he is really great uh, please do follow if you are using uh, you know twitter okay i have given the name travis alpha uh, alpha i might be pronouncing it wrongly depending upon your re region uh, i believe this is a french thing um, you know i can be mistaken there as well okay it is an open source project and you can use it freely it was really you know great to understand the progression of numpy and it also gives you a great deal of in, uh, understanding in terms of which type of linear al algebra suits to your current need in a better scenario okay so um, uh, that's what uh, uh, i'm suggesting try to follow him on twitter or something okay numpy stands for numerical python we just discussed that numpy arrays are sorted at one continuous place in a memory unlike the list now uh, uh, we are trying to go in depth of how numpy made efficient to a great level even by the creator and the data scientist community so how they do make it clear uh, the more efficient they try to use continuous memory continuous random access memory whenever they try to get load in terms of as an variable continuation in terms of the data continuation okay so they are trying to patch it up the inefficiency in a few ways so the process can be access and manipulate them very efficiently now why we keep stressing on efficiency because we normally work on a huge data set and that's why efficiency does matter a lot whenever you try to crunch a bigger amount of data and that's why efficiency is a real ball game as a uh, couple of um, uh, uh, data scientist community uh, is concerned the behavior is called locality of reference in a computer science now locality of reference there are quite a good um, number of uh, thesis available on ieee site uh, and quite a few of them are free of cost so if you have a guest login you can still go and have a look at uh, you know on ieee site for uh, locality of reference okay this talks about uh, specifically referencing the local data available to you and get it efficiently used within your data science research okay but if you go uh, into the depth there are quite a few terminologies they have developed right now so if you are using local data quite effectively at your job we might uh, take a deep dive into locality of reference we might have you know couple of sundays going over this locality of reference how do you uh, locality of reference part me for that and what are the different method available in numpy or Py, uh, pandas uh, to make sure we address all those challenges in locality of references okay but right now uh, just keep in the mind the locality of reference uh, i have never seen an interview ask you a question on locality of reference but yes is a probability yes it can be a probability we might discuss uh, you know um, after we complete our solution in part okay um, this is the main reason why numpy is faster than list it also uh, it is optimized to work with the latest cpu architecture yes as we know there are co processors right as we discussed in our last session there are co processor or mathematical processors coming into existence uh, 
uh, existed in la, uh, in uh, you know 1995 is 1996 oh sorry uh, in 1990s right to speak altogether where we are having an additional cpu to process our mathematical need specifically on intel platform or amd platform nowadays so what this cpu architecture helps you out this helps you out with crunching the data at a much faster rate than a singular cpu so i include these mathematical co-processor as they call co-processor a cooperative processor you can see in a way to the main processor so still my instruction queue my interrupts are with the main processor but i have a specific math i uh, you know instruction queue for my math processor also so if there there are certain things which are reserved for mathematical executions uh, like I'm talking about linear algebras and blah, blah, blah things. So I normally transfer the queues to the my uh, co-processor. Now, how that is transferred is the gambit of OS, how the OS is programmed. Now, as far as uh, NumPy goes, NumPy has a specific, uh, specific uh, you know, changes for this multi-CPU based architecture. So if you want to choose a NumPy, you have to choose this according to your CPUs according to the math processor available with you on your uh, desktop, laptops, whatever you use. Okay, so NumPy is fine-tuned with the CPU architectures as well. Now, don't, uh, you know, uh, confuse yourself when we reference, reference CPU architecture is internal CPU architecture. Yes, it has to do with internal CPU architecture, but it has more to do with the extra CPU available for the mathematical calculation. Am I confusing you or are, are we good in terms of understanding the, you know, NumPy um, inception for, uh, you know, Python data scientist solutioning? I'm good. Yeah. Good, right? yeah. Okay, no problem. I know this is a bit confusing and uh, unless you try to vocal it out in your uh, uh, thought process try to speak these things out or try to explain this thing to somebody so that you'll understand in depth how uh, these library are made for some specific purpose and what are those purpose and these questions do get asked in the interview why do you use numpy why do you use pandas why do you use these two together and even <laughs> for that thing we'll have answer in a couple of slides let me play you a you know good uh, video to understand how these numpy helps me uh, in terms of uh, why it's called the best Python library. Yes, it's called as best Python library. Uh, this is more to go with non-scientific uh, scientific way. <laughs> but uh, yes, uh, okay. It's a you know, good video. Hi guys. Now, yeah, uh, this fellow will have, uh, okay. Uh, let me uh, start this. Oh, come on. Sorry, yeah. Sometimes this Zoom gets stuck. I don't know why. Yeah, uh, could you see the you know guy with the specs? yeah yeah now we'll see a couple of uh, good videos from this guy uh this uh, i don't remember his name uh this is one of the you know really vocal uh, open system um, scientists he's working on data scientists for last uh, five six years he has his own blog he has his own you know organization where he uh, supports quite a few robotic companies in terms of uh you know uh, bringing uh, bigger uh, ML libraries. Uh, uh, he is also vocal about his, uh, you know, uh, what you can say, oppositions for NLP. Well, NLP is still, you know, more of uh, evolutionary um, thought process of data scientists. But there are some data scientists who are against it or who don't really venture or spend their efforts in those uh, lines. They believe that it's uh, too futuristic right now and we might need to enable ourselves uh, before that. So, you know, whenever we're trying to uh, gain knowledge, there are certain individuals who have their own preconceived mind. Even I might have some. And believe me, as a scientist, we need to move above and beyond on all such blockages. And we normally refer them as a mind blockages. Do we know them? Yes, we do know them. But we have those things and you can't, uh, you know, uh, skip them most of the time. Right? And this is because of our upbringing, our culture, uh, our learnings, and so on and so forth. And for that matter, quite a uh, you know, few of our mind blocks might uh, you know, take us to a level where I, we couldn't think of out of the box in many a times. So for such scenario, we need to understand pitfall and try to stay away from it. 
okay and for that matter i keep uh, you know giving these pointers to you if you find useful please do use it if you find irritating please say so and i'll stop talking on those things these are uh, kind of you know extra experience matters which i have shared with you in terms of my learning okay can i be wrong yes i can be wrong but yes these are the experience which i have learned so i'm just sharing with you you might decide to ignore it as well okay so let me you know play this video for you we are trying to understand the importance of so these are these might look couple of lines of programs but the value they carry in terms of thing are huge believe me a typical face recognition type typical understanding of the you know color pattern type the way he have you know negate those uh, um, images uh, converting the image from land landscape uh, to portrait portrait to landscape uh, calibrating the image in terms of colors or you know uh, threshold of colors and so on forth this is a real fun but it's more of a um, critical business value in nature if you look at it that way so we need to understand such scenarios and we need to work towards it and even start thinking on what you like to do best with this data scientist community it's a huge community there are many solutions to make there are many things to do and we are still basically trying to get, uh, get a shape in terms of defined data science as such right so for that matters we are trying to address quite a few number of uh, you know um, learning challenges here but just spread your wing try to do a couple of things try to do many a solutions where you can actually start understanding uh, your likings your satisfaction within this solution does that make sense for you yes yeah. any questions for me on these no instruction no okay. now let's try to understand uh, numpy and pandas why these two separate libraries okay now uh as far as data scientist goes we are scientists so what we do we try to build a specific library for specific solutions so whenever uh, you are talking about generic solutions most of the time we use pandas and numpy but whenever things go specific we either choose pandas and numpy or we might choose both because there are certain things which are best in these two so let's try to understand the difference let's start to understand the utilities of these two together okay so let me uh, share my ideas again this is what i learned and this is a you know what you can say the filled with the um, no horizons in sight kind of scenario so even whatever i learn can be limited by my experiences can be limited by my understanding as well so you need to play around you need to really start understanding by you, yourself i'll share whatever i find it really right interesting for me you might find it other uh, way around and this can happen okay i don't want to create uh, you know conflicts but i'm trying to guide you in terms of how we need to start learning on ourselves rather than depending on some ravindra or somebody else as well for that matters okay so start understanding what you like what you like to do in terms of data scientist uh, experiences or what type of jobs you trying to Uh, more attached to more involved with and so on and so forth and yes um, as far as what i told you about the you know face recognition uh, normally about 80% of uh, these um, you know python data scientists in face recognitions are indians so this is kind of emerging cultural advantage we have as far as indians because we are statistician mathematician jugadu as we call it in hindi right so this suits more towards basically cultural upbringing that's why i i say i might be wrong but this is what my experience is and that's how makes indian more aligned to do such jobs to do such a uh, thinking process which comes easy to us if you ask any you know um, um american or south african for that matter you will get a different ideas try to ask this question to some of your colleagues and you'll understand what i'm trying to say here we find it quite easier because it comes to us as a easier we are statistician by birth so believe me we have that attitude by birth it's up, uh, in our bringing by itself we are mathematicians so that's why this comes easy to us okay 
but don't think what come easy to us have a lesser value and this is the mistake even i do quite a few times okay so try to put it in a light of whatever solution are requirement at hand and then try to portray it as a solution okay so let's try to understand pandas versus numpy uh, i have uh, named it as versus but it's more to do with pandas compared with numpy okay let's have a look the array object in numpy is called nd array it provides a lot of supporting functions that make working with nd array very easy we we'll just seen a couple of them uh, or few of them you can go to wt school and you have all those you know big number of alternatives available as of date with the current version w3 schools don't uh, you know ever um, uh, um, miss those name okay this name is really important it gives you the current updates and even the total data scientist community look at it w3 schools started as a help towards html in the good old 90s but now it's purely scientific community and specifically python data science relies on w3 school in a great scenario so even if a scientist have developed something new he might relate to w3 school it's not a paid community they have a way of awarding certain things but more or less it's a open source community so you can contribute even you can contribute but yes there's a i think a screening board or you know some screening committee who does screen those thing if it's not already done and if it's really important and blah 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 things but yes you have awards in w3 school for contribution as well okay chalo let's uh, you know have a look at pandas versus numpy the array object in numpy is called nd array provides a lot of supporting functions that makes working in nd array very easy arrays are very frequently used in data science where speed and resources are very important okay as we uh, discuss uh, data frames and then arrays these are the two most used variables within python data science community data retrieval versus data crunching so data retrieval you retrieve the data as we uh, you know check in cvs file so either you pull the data with query and dump it in a cvs file which is a tab separated or comma separated database and i this is what i call retrieval now crunching crunching in the sense i start using the data i start cleaning it i start aligning it i start indexing it and so on and so forth and uh, um, the image itself is a data frame itself is an array of pixels based weightage of colors do you agree with me the yeah, image okay. yep yeah. yes okay i'll, I'll repeat it again the image is basically uh nd array or an array and we specific a uh, two dimension array where i have pixels inserted as an weightage to the colors or the balance of colors okay so i have a pixel like like right right now i'm using a monitor with uh, you know h uh, full hd so 180p by uh, 108p by 180p now this i have so many pixels by so many pixels in my nd array which are getting painted at uh, 45 um pixels uh, or for 45 retrace cycles per second because that's what i set as a my display card um, uh, refresh rate so this is how refresh rate to display card really matters every movie is a set of frames coming to you at a particular seconds as a visuals data scientist you need to remember these things what is rasterization what is a image on your monitor on your screen on your uh, you know tv and all those thing which are coming or the screen is getting reprinted or repainted by the number of frames per second as the refresh rate so the more the refresh rate your eye feels moving into it the less of the refresh rate you get a flickery feeling so if you normally watch the older cartoon movie might be donald duck popeye i i like them believe me they had a refresh rate at around 20 frame per second you still feel feel flickery whenever you watch those things but if you watch the new latest movie of tom and jerry i forgot the name which has a refresh rate of around 60 so they created that movie with a 60 frame per second and even if your uh, you know device is clamped like mine as 45 it has a smooth effect to your eyes rather than the older cartoon movie 
even if you look at 1950s and 40s movies the flicker rate was clamped at 20 16 to 20 was the refresh rate they have clamped that projector you know those uh, you know wheel uh, wheel of films getting played on a projector with the actual light and that uh, you know light beam that was at 20 frames per second so if you count those films in that you know a big wheel base it's 20 films per second and that's getting projected on the screen uh, in front of you and that's how that projector that light used to work but now we have the same mechanism within your tv lcd led tvs okay i hope you understand what i'm trying to say and this way we normally um, basically start crunching the data start updating the data as per the requirement in your data scientific solution the source code of numpy is available on a github repository also so you can actually have a look at numpy i don't advise you right now but once you are uh, in your career let's say uh, a year down the line you might have a look at numpy source code and you might create another numpy version uh, you can call it ruby pi or whatever you want to call it as per your name basically so you can do that as well and this is the most important fun in open source community and you can release those things if you can do a good amount of additions to that or you can update numpy with your methods as well and your name will be included as an authors or contributory factors with the numpy and pandas as well these are all open system repository or open system libraries they call them repository or library either way but it's mostly you know referred as library let's understand Oh my, sorry. Uh, let's understand why I have to use NumPy with Pandas developed for us already. Let me, you know, play a small video for you where we will understand uh, how, yeah, we are looking at random numbers in NumPy. So as a data scientist, we must be vigilant about uh, anything chosen for us as a part of solution. As we choose this random number contain many times, we must be careful what it contains. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to restrict the randomness of a random number as well. Let's see how. If there is a program to generate a ran random number, it can be predicted. Thus, it is not truly random. Basically, we are trying to go into the randomized function in depth and try to pull out details like how it will give me number three, number five, number six, whatever number is generating as a random. So random numbers generated through a generation algorithms are called pseudo random and this is a real uh, you know thing means uh, there's a algorithm called pseudo random algorithm which generates random number for you numpy offers the random module to work with the random numbers now as a data scientist i'm trying to restrict the random number generation so how do you restrict it let's try a simple three line program to see what it generates for us and let's rub it three, four times to make sure it contains getting delivered within this 2D array. What I'm trying to do from NumPy, random, I'm generating random numbers, okay? Three and five, between three and five. So let me try to play this for you. I have this, you know, random number P by, I already given it to you. Let, uh, let me open this thing. Uh, random number, yes, random number. Simple three line program. I have changed the number as well. I'll just clear these things. Okay, and I'll play this thing. So I got these numbers. So I, what I've asked it, 10 row, oh, I think, uh, okay, let's do by two, three. This is really, you know, two, two by three. Okay, let's try to run this one. So it's like two rows, three columns. Okay, previously I have tried some 10 rows and so many columns, okay? No, I think we can ahead. see. I think we cannot oh, pardon see. Me, pardon, pardon, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. Sorry. Where am I? Yeah, here, here. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So, uh, first I have tried with some, you know, bigger rate, uh, randomized function. Oh, come on. I have tried with 12 or, you know, something like that. So, I'm trying to use random number, right? So, it's like 12 rows and uh, 30 columns. And then I, you know, started basically playing with smaller data, uh, you know, uh, rows and columns. So here, smaller rows and columns. So I'm trying to restrict uh, my, you know, random number generation within a gambit of uh, so many uh, things. And these random numbers are generated within zero to one. And if you look at it, it's starting with a smaller number 
and ending with bigger number. I'm just trying to analyze uh, the algorithm of randomness in Python data science or within uh, NumPy discipline. Okay. Could you see these numbers on the screen, right? You yeah. play around with yourself. Yep. Uh, you play around with this program and you'll get actual idea. The program name is uh, a random no, random no dot py. Okay. I've already given it to you. So have a look at it. Okay. And you will get an idea of how the random number is being generated in Python. Okay. Let's take a step further. Now let's start to understand the PDF probability density function. We have studied this in our statistical discussion point. A random number distribution is a set of random numbers that follow a certain probability density function. A function that describes continuous probability, probability of all values in the app. The PDF is used to specify probability of a random variable falling within a particular range of values at opposed to taking of any one value. The probability is given by integral of its variable, variables PDF over that range. That is, uh, that is, it's given by the area under density function, but above the horizontal, ax uh, horizontal axis and between the lowest and greatest values of the range. The probability density function is a non-negative everywhere and it's integral over the entire space equal to one. So what I'm trying to do here, I'm trying to have a random number within zero to one with the number of rows and columns you have asked for it. Now here, I'm trying to go in depth and trying to find out how the randomness is function, okay? So let me play, uh, play another, uh, you know, uh, uh, program uh, with you, which is named as, uh, okay. Can you see my spider screen? Oh, come on, not this one. Can you see my spider screen, yeah. sir, madam? Yeah. So now I'll open a program called uh, what, uh, PDF Python dot PI, right? PDF. I'll close this thing. There are too many, you know. Okay. PDF Python. So this is a probability density function. Yes. It's a simple program. And, uh, you know, we have choose a random, uh, you know, uh, convert a string to uh, uh, convert the numbers and uh, I will try to have these things of a size, right? So let me clear these things as well. Uh, okay, the console and I'll play this for you. So here, what I've tried to do, try to, uh, you know, generate a PDF, a probability density function for my randomized variables. And I have included a choice in the random way. Okay, so if I go, and you know, um, have a look at the uh, W3 school uh, page where I'll try to understand the randomness of a uh, random in Python. Uh, we have search it here. Okay. Okay, here. Random in PY. So there's a Python random uh, module, and here we have all the latest functions available to us. Okay, have a look at this and you'll get an idea of how this random value works in Python, right? So there's a shuffle, random, uh, random float between normal random, the float is between zero to one. Okay, then you have other, you know, different methods available for you. And, you know, we can restrict the Python numbers generation with some preconceived uh, or you know predefined um, uh, restrictions as well, and that's why understanding Python function is uh, in uh, Python is a really good way, so that we can restrict the output up to a great extent, and for that PDF also does help us a lot. Okay, does that make sense to you? Yes, I understand. Uh, then we'll uh, okay. It's almost eight six now. I'll not stretch you much more. We'll basically try to understand shuffling of arrays. Here we'll play around with, uh, you know, uh, various array shuffling. Then overall we'll understand the Python distribution. We'll try to understand uh, the C1 after that, okay? So that's another uh, library we're going to learn for that. Let's stop here today. 
there'll be no next class because I have my LLM exam. So there'll be no session on Monday. We'll have, uh, uh, there's no session on Saturday. There's no session on Monday. So we have leave for two sessions. So please do work on, uh, you know, uh, your understanding in terms of five, uh, pandas and numpies. Try to play around with the, you know, random variables. I'm going to share this PDF with you. And then we'll go deep into the, you know, overall uh, uh, deeper statistical terminologies here forth. And we'll try to understand how we can have a restrictive, uh, you know, uh, data scientist uh, solutioning via these, uh, you know, methods and libraries uh, step by step. Okay. Anybody have any question for me at this moment? Okay. No. Okay. So let me stop it. And please, please, please. Uh, do practice, do create your own thought process or experience on these uh, lines of solutioning, because these are really critical. These are the basics for our next solutioning. Unless you know, you know, or, or unless you haven't practiced this thing out, it'll be really imaginary, uh, uh, you know, if we start going ahead uh, by leaps and bounds. Okay, so please, uh, my humble request, try to uh, work on this, try to, you know, uh, 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 do it on your own, play around with it, gets your hands dirty, you know, it's the same thing one, and, uh, one after the other, but unless you try by yourself, it's really difficult. If you want to uh, have a homework, what I would really like uh, to get a photo, yours or anybody else photo or get that Mona Lisa photo available on the net also, which is available in all uh, size of pixels and resolutions, uh, get it and try to put a goggle on it or a blindfold to be precise on it. It's simple, you need to search for the pixels starting pixel, ending pixels, vertical, horizontal, and I try to apply that blindfold to her. Okay, try to do it on your own. Take it as a homework, okay? So blindfold Mona Lisa is your homework. Okay. And we don't have our next, go ahead, ma'am. No, okay, I said blindfold Mona Lisa, okay. Yeah, you can take your photo and blindfold yourself. Or no, your... no, that's fine. Because Mona Lisa is available on the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the photos are available in all shapes and sizes. So whatever you're comfortable, you can take the lowest resolution because there'll be, you know, hardly 480 by uh, 640 or 640 by 480. Or you can have a lesser also. So play around with it so that, you know, you'll get idea of how the face recognition work and include the project of face recognition in your, you know, uh, profile as well. And you can uh, explain it in depth. And this is what we do, basically. So you can explain the pixel uh, formatting of it. You can explain the resolution part of it. You can explain the uh, gradient of coloring, gradient of, uh, you know, uh, or the masking of pixels and all those things. It's simple, but unless you try, I can go on speaking because I've tried those things, okay? So uh, if you tried, you can speak about it at length or you can explain it in depth, even if somebody asks some difficult question also, okay? Chal, sure. So let me stop here. Uh, anybody have any question for me at this moment? No. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for a lot for your timing. I'm going to release this in a couple of hours. That'll be a bit night for you. But yes, uh, by tomorrow morning, we'll have this uh, session recording uh, handy for you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your time. Have a good Thank night you. and good weekend. There's no class on Saturday and, and Monday. I have my LLM exams. Okay. Pardon me for that. All Thank the best. You. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you, ma'am. No Thanks. Problem. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. Take care.